the Screen News Digest is presented to school students by the Pacific Gas and Electric Company. PG&E, providing the energy California needs to keep growing. Natural gas for homes, business, and industry. Power from falling water. Gas and oil field plants and electric power that comes from the atom. I think all of us are in concurrence in wishing to make clear that we were there primarily as scientists and only secondarily if you know a minor consideration was that we were there as women if we're going to try to develop and, and grow animals in the ocean to feed the um, people and the overpopulation problem we have to know how to grow them and what they depend on as an ecologist I'm very concerned about community structure and interrelationships among the animals down there we could have never obtained the same amount of information in two weeks period working from the surface. It would have taken us at least, uh, I would say, half a year. Tektite in general was great, and as everyone said, we all want to go back again. For the Aquamaids in Tektite too, like the astronauts in Project Apollo, the mission begins with a preliminary period of intensive training. Instructors explain the complex support systems that will sustain them during their fortnight at Nine Fathoms. Dr. Sylvia Earle, Alina Schmunt, Peggy Lucas, Dr. Renata True, and Anne Hartline. These are the female aquanauts in the pioneering project. Off the coast of St. John in the Virgin Islands is the habitat built by the General Electric Company with four rooms in its two steel tanks. 150,000 pounds of scrap ore used as ballast are loaded by hand. Underwater, divers work on the life support cables that are to provide the habitat with oxygen, fresh water, electrical power, and direct communications with a command van on land. Project and habitat are named tektite after meteorites that are found in the sea. The girls are among 62 scientists chosen to live, work, and be observed on the floor of Greater Lampshire Bay in the Caribbean. Elena Schmack has a master's degree in marine biology, Renata True a doctorate in oceanography, Anne Hartline is a marine ecologist, and Peggy Lucas an electrical engineer. As part of the seven-month Tektite II program, the women aquanauts are to join other scientists, engineers, and doctors in studying marine animal behavior, reef pollution, and human behavior in underwater conditions. The project is America's only man-in-the-sea research program. For Dr. Earle and her team, their time has come, their turn is at hand. This is an historic moment as the girls make ready to submerge and swim underwater 200 yards to the habitat. In an exclusive Screen News Digest interview, Dr. Earl recalls in her own words the highlights of the mission, including how her team was chosen. For participation in the Tektite program, selection was primarily based on a person's confidence in, in his field in science and people were, scientists were asked to submit proposals and those who are involved did submit proposals and were selected primarily on the basis of, of that. Secondarily, on their competence as divers, whether they could handle themselves well underwater. From the beginning, the girls show that they are on all counts well chosen and well qualified. Their journey to Tektite II is uneventful, and one by one they enter the Cadillac of habitats. Here for a fortnight, the girls are pioneers in the exploration of inner space. 
probing the secrets of a marine environment as mysterious, remote, and little known as the surface of the moon. And so they settle down with all the comforts of home. TV, radio, hi-fi, refrigerator, stove, and wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. The habitat is, in a sense, an aquarium in reverse, where fish swim by and observe human beings. Collecting specimens from the ocean floor, the girls work in pairs, venturing out as far as 1,500 feet from the habitat. And to keep from getting lost, they carry compasses and listening devices that home in on directional signals from Tektite 2. Before the use of underwater habitats, divers had to work from and return to the surface. Expeditions to depths of 50 feet were limited to 90 minutes. Now with Tektite 2 as a home base, scientists can put in a full eight-hour day. And in the habitat, specimens and samples can be catalogued and classified. Another very um, immediate advantage to a program of this sort is that you are in isolation. The distractions of topside activities are minimized. And this is highly productive. This is a fertile field for underwater exploration, teeming with hundreds of species of marine life. People, for the first time, were shown to be able to work underwater in a way more or less comparable with working on land. And this is probably only possible using an undersea base, a habitat, and using some of the sophisticated new diving equipment, such as the rebreathers that enable people to stay in the water for long periods of time. Since the rebreather makes no air bubbles, aquanauts can even swim among schools of fish. The unit, which cleans and recycles its air supply, also enables divers to stay outside the habitat for seven to ten hours. When you go in and out and see the same fishes, the same rocks, the same everything, uh, repeatedly, as a resident, you don't surface and get back to the ordinary day-to-day -day affairs of a human being. You're, you're, your viewpoint changes and you begin to see things that, that are obvious once you've been there, but are not obvious unless you have this, this viewpoint, this vantage point. Science has taken a significant step in making men and women at home in the sea. Not only did we begin to feel as, as if we belonged in the environment, but it seemed that the fishes and other animals began to accept us with, with little or no concern, to take little, little notice of us as if we were a part of, of the activities instead of some, an intruder. And so the girls roam the reefs, unlocking more and more the secrets of inner space. But the net result of the program demonstrated the effectiveness of saturation diving and habitat, the use of a habitat underwater as really an exciting new technique for undersea exploration. After two weeks, the aquamaids agree that the only thing men can do down here that we can't is grow beards. Topside at the end of the mission, a pressurized transfer capsule is lowered into the water to ferry the girls from the ocean floor to a decompression tank on the surface. This is a delicate operation. At a depth of 50 feet, the girls have been breathing a mixture of 92% nitrogen and 8% oxygen. A too rapid return to surface pressure will cause the nitrogen in their blood to bubble up like soda water in a newly opened bottle. This, in turn, will cause a painful and sometimes fatal condition known as the bends. But for Dr. Earle and her team, the journey topside is as uneventful as the rest of their historic mission. The aquamaids have returned to familiar sights and surroundings, and from inside the transfer capsule, Alina Schmont signals that all is well. 
The five girls are all inside the capsule as it is mated to the decompression chamber. They will remain inside for 20 hours as their nitrogen saturated bodies are returned to sea level pressure. Dr. Earle is first to leave the decompression chamber with the observation that it's been the safest two weeks of my life. Officials of the Interior Department, which coordinated the project, are on hand to greet the world's first women aquanauts. Though the underwater environment has been strange, the hours long and the work hard, the girls are unanimous in wanting to return to the fascinating world of inner space. Snoopy, too, is raring to go back. Home are the Aquamaids, home from the sea. Later, Dr. Earle and her team undergo thorough medical examinations. Scientists want to know all there is to know about the effects on humans of living and working in the sea. When the tests are completed, the results show that one and all are A-OK. -okay. Months later in California, Tektite II, the Virgin Islands, and Greater Lambshire Bay are just memories as Dr. Earl, wife and mother, plays with her daughter Elizabeth, 10, and her son Richie, 8. There's a third child, Gail, age 2, as Sylvia Earl, in her home and in her work, finds expression, meaning, fulfillment. In her study, she has time to analyze many of the specimens collected in Tektite II. Her work, and others like it, hold great promise for a world whose population is expected to double to six billion by the year 2000. One day, perhaps, man will have fish farms in the sea. The fish, kept in pens and fed concentrated foods, will be raised from fertilized eggs to maturity. For Dr. Earle and her husband, Dr. Giles Mead, director of the Los Angeles County Museum of Natural History, Tektite II is a significant milestone in reaching that day. And though Tektite II is ended, plans for Tektite III are already underway. Looking to the future, Dr. Earle says... The, the future for such programs is exciting indeed. The applications for uh, the use of underwater habitats as a technique for, for industry, for certainly for science, as well as uh, many other practical applications, undersea farming, for mining. The uses are, are definitely foreseeable, and it is hoped that it will, will continue. The opportunities, not only in this area for uh, many people, but in, in science as a whole, will continue to increase this era of an awareness of the environment and the need for knowledge about all aspects of the environment, whether on the land or on the sea. Mankind harvesting marine life, hotels on the ocean's floor, tourist liners prowling the deep. These are no longer impossible dreams as men and women probe and push back the frontiers of inner space. The Screen News Digest has been brought to you by your friends and neighbors at Pacific Gas and Electric Company, PG&E, providing natural gas and electric power for the homes, businesses, and industries of growing California.